you so much for spending uh, this afternoon with me. Um, I will try my very best uh, to share as much as I can. Um, but I thought that what I would do is to tell you uh, two things that I read recently. One was actually about two days ago. I'm not sure how many of you uh, saw this news article. But it was something that tried to capture the emotional state of our world. Hmm? It was an, an index and it tried to cover uh, what is the emotional state of our world. And it found that in today's world, 2019, if we think of the global humanity, uh, uh, the situation of global humanity, global humanity is, believe this or not, at its saddest, at its angriest, and at its most fearful. And we are actually in a developed world. I mean, if we look at the history of humanity, we are at the stage when the world is most developed because one of the, of the, the, the whole uh, session that I'm supposed to talk about is caring in a developed world, right? So we are at the most developed world. So what actually is, what is it telling us about our developed world? So I'll come back to that. The next news item that I read was only today. It was so heartbreaking for me. I uh, didn't know whether to cry deeply and not come, or to come and cry with you. <laughs> so it was, I think some of you, especially those who work with factory workers or with migrant workers, would know what happened six years ago on the 24th of April in Bangladesh. Rana Plaza happened and 1,138 textile workers, most of them women, but some of them men, were killed because the building was shaking and they were still forced to go in because they were not allowed to have a voice and their voice wasn't taken seriously. Now, there were a lot of volunteers helping with that incident. There were lots and lots, men and women. And today, when I opened my uh, news from Channel News Asia, there was this horrible story about the hero of that rescue mission, a 27-year-old young man. So think of him being 21 years old. He committed suicide because he was so depressed and he couldn't get out of his depression. So, so, so I thought that that story, actually those two items can start me off in terms of caring, and in terms of the developed world and how to care in the developed world that we don't actually destroy ourselves in the process, right? Because I know that all of you are here today because you are carers and you care. So how on earth do we make sure that we're there not for the short run, but for the long run? And how do we support each other in a caring community? So let me go back to the developed world. Why is it People are at its, their saddest, angriest, and most fearful. Well, we are living, I think, the way I understand it, is that we are living at what I call a world of great paradoxes. And let me explain what I mean. Dear friends, we are at the time when we are at the richest we're at the richest. But this wealth is highly concentrated. I just saw the figures that came out from Swiss Credit 217 Global Wealth Report. And they said, and this is not from an NGO, it's from Credit Suisse, that 1% of the world's population owns half the world's wealth. So we are talking about extreme inequalities and the hollowing out of the middle class. And we wonder why is it people are struggling so hard and can't make things happen. Then we are the most connected in the world today because of technology, because of social media, 
We are so connected. Everybody knows everything almost instantly. And yet, we are drifting apart. Drifting apart, why? Because of identity politics, because of hate speech, because of us versus them, the demonization of the other, the lack of understanding, the lack of respect. The, the culture of disrespect is actually coming back as we are also getting more and more connected. So we are globalizing, but we are also globalizing fragmentation. Okay? And, and that is something of very serious concern. Now, the third area that I'm very concerned about, and which is a, another great paradox for me, is that whilst we, are, we have become rich because of technological advances, Today, despite the economic, uh, uh, the economic inequalities, technology in terms of the fourth industrial revolution is creating economic insecurity. So you are fearful about the future, especially the young. You are fearful about the fact that uh, the world may not actually survive if we don't handle climate change. Right? And therefore, the, the third issue is that we have the greatest knowledge in our world today, but we don't have the wisdom to even know how to actually ensure that the human species actually survive in a more sustainable way and that we live a more sustainable and inclusive society for the next generation. So, of course, given all this environment, you can't help but think, why are people sadder? Why are they angrier and why are they more fearful? And on top of that, we start conflicts and wars that we do not know how to solve. Think of Syria, think of Yemen, think of, uh, of just around the corner, uh, what is happening uh, with the, with, uh, in Myanmar. Think of the fact that Asia, whilst we're at our richest, we also house the world's largest refugee camp, not very far from Singapore. Hmm? So, so, of course, there is all these insecurities. Now, actually, given that horrible state of the developed world, a uh, uh, very significant uh, and important leader in Singapore recently at a dinner asked me, is this the worst stage of insecurity that we have found ourselves? And my answer is no. My answer is no. And he was very surprised. And I said no, and I will come to some of the work uh, kind of later on, because I, I have a historical memory, and I know the history of the United Nations. After the Second World War, 1945, the leaders of the world came together for a purpose. And it was a collective purpose of how do we reshape the rules of the world and the ground rules of the world in such a way that we don't get a repeat of the Second World War because of the untold sorrow I mean, we went through, humanity went through untold sorrow and also the indication of the self-destruction nature of humanity. And, and, and how do we save ourselves from self-destruction and how do we save ourselves from untold sorrow? So they came together to establish ground rules, right? And they created the UN Charter. So, so the United Nations Charter starts with we, the peoples, and what does it, I'm not going to go through the whole charter, but they'll take a whole uh, of, of my speech. But basically, there are three areas that they actually talk about if we're talking about bonding and, and trying to create global community. And this is shared values. We need to have a foundation of shared values that everybody respects. And know that unless we have these shared values, we're not going to survive or survive in the way we want. Hmm? We have to have shared responsibilities. It's not you are the one to, 
that should do it. You are the, you are the one that had the purpose, so you go and do it. The rest of us will just sit down and shake our legs, right? But so it's like everybody has a shared shared responsibility to make the type of world we want. And the third area, every single human being, independent of color, independent of income, independent of looks, independent of disabilities or abilities, have dignity. So the dignity of each and every single human life got to be respected, or else we'll have what we had during the Second World War, the, the tide of Holocaust, the genocides, and so on. So we need to keep all that in mind. So I start that as to why I spent almost, most of my life uh, working in the United Nations. I know that many of you, when you think of the United Nations, you think of huge bureaucracies. Uh, in my case, I accept the huge bureaucracies, but it doesn't frighten me. Uh, it's the, one of the most complicated political arena to work in. That doesn't frighten me uh, because I actually keep the values deep into my being, and I try to see how to make those values happen. Now, how does all that apply to Singapore before I, I talked about the work? Singapore gained independence in 1965, right? How, what, um, how do we tell the world that we are independent and we are a sovereign state and everybody should respect us as a nation state? It is through raising our flag at the United Nations. So on the 21st, of September 1965, Singapore raised its first flag to say we are a nation. We are a nation and, and we, are, they be, uh, we became the 117 nation of the United Nations. And with that, what does it mean to be a member of the United Nations? It means that we accept the values of the Charter we actually uh, commit ourselves to take care of our people and we commit ourselves to be responsible players in the international community. I won't uh, talk too much because all of you know about Singapore's story and all that, but, but it's just to say that uh, we are part of the international community because there are core values that have actually shaped our world and those values were written in 19... 45, because there was a, a collective purpose and leadership of people who cared about the type of world we want. And we have survived and we have become rich and we have been able to prosper because there are ground rules, right? So, with that, let me start <laughs> telling you about my personal experience. So what does, what does it mean to work so long in the United Nations and how did I try to make uh, those values come to life, okay? So uh, the thing was that, I won't tell you too much of my story, but just to go straight to how I was asked to, be, to lead the, the, the Women's Fund. And this was actually at a pivotal moment. And it was at a pivotal moment where new rules, because even if you've written the rules in 1945, the world changes so much. So you need to keep on revising some of the rules, or to make it better, or especially in terms of the implementation, because it doesn't mean that you make rules and then everybody then implement. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that the world doesn't change, right? So there was a pivotal moment uh, when I was asked to come in, and this was at the time when the Berlin Wall fell. It was at the end of the Cold War. It was the dissolution of the uh, Soviet uh, Union, yeah? uh, and it was uh, basically a time where all the governments came together again to look at how to develop a development agenda that could move the world forward based on all the, the problems that they saw emerging. Because even though they talked about, you know, we have to uh, take care of our people and so on, not everybody had the capacities and so on. And so uh, uh, there was a whole series of UN 
conferences, uh, some on climate change, uh, uh, I mean, the Rio meetings on sustainable development, on environmental development came up, so caring for our planet, because we tend to grow so fast, but without taking care of our ecosystem. Uh, there was uh, issues of uh, growing so fast and not being able to take care of people, so most people continue to work in, pr in precarious employment and so on, and therefore there was a whole series on social development, there was a whole series on the type of uh, economies that we need to have to take care of poverty and so on and so forth. I uh, was asked to take the lead on preparing for the Fourth World Conference on Women. Okay? So, so it meant rewriting some of the global rules or putting on the agenda issues that were overlooked up to that time. So put your mind back many years to 1994. So these were the issues that I picked up. Okay? So the Fourth World Conference on Women basically was really to design policies, legal and social frameworks on how do we ensure that there is women's uh, empowerment and the things, the issues that I focused on was women's economic security and rights. And this is the whole thing about how do we value women's work and give adequate value. Because most of the time, we are, we, I found that women, as I told you about this, uh, the, the issue of the, of the Rana Plaza, most of them would be working at the lower, at the at lower echelon of the, of the employment sector, and then they would not have the voice, neither would they be taken seriously, and they are seen as cheap labor and commodities rather than as human beings, right? So, so it is interesting that after all the hard work, it, it, that, that women's work today, even by IMF, is seen as smart economics and smart business. So you can imagine when we started, it was like a new, it was like a new thinking. But my message here is that new thinking that starts from the margins can become so mainstream and central. And today I can't believe that even the corporations are saying, unless we have a diversified workforce, we're not going to be profitable, or we're not going to uh, survive uh, as, as a corporation. Uh, and, and the monetary fund uh, that was so difficult at one stage because of the social adjustment programs and so on are now leading. I mean, Christine Lahat talks all the time about gender equality uh, as smart economics. The other issue was the life free from violence. And this was because at that time, you wouldn't believe this, but all the violence that was happening was seen as a private affair. And, and nobody, he was not seen as something that the, the, the state should get involved with. It should not, it was not, it was seen as shrouded in shame and, 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 and embarrassment. And nobody wanted to talk about the nature of violence that people were experiencing, right? So we made it very open and you can't believe it because I mean, I, it also took me by total surprise that there was a convention on to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women that came into being, this is CEDAW, many of you know, um, was it came into being in 1979. Do you know that the issue of violence was not even in it, as seen as part of discrimination? It took 1993 for the Cairo meeting on human rights that actually put it on the agenda, and it took our work to actually bring it to the General Assembly and to really made it something. And today, look at it. It is now on everybody's agenda. Everybody. I mean, even if something happens, uh, like uh, well, what happened recently in uh, uh, NUS, everybody gets involved and, and shouts and so on. So you can imagine an issue that was so marginalized, so shameful, nobody wanted to talk about. Now, everybody talks about, it's on everybody's agenda, and it changes behavior. Okay? So I'm talking about all this because Change that you, once upon a time we thought can never happen, can happen, right? So, 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 so I don't believe that our world need to be sadder, angrier, and no, fearful, okay? Because the point is to know what are the issues that are keeping us there and how to actually make that change happen, okay? So, the third one, uh, the other uh, issue that I talk about, okay, is the women, peace, and security uh, agenda. And this is one of my, I mean, I think I put in so much work on this because whilst I was the executive director of the Women's Fund, one thing was the globalizing world, one thing was all the wonderful things that was happening with all the UN conferences, 
But right before my eyes were all the genocides that were happening. The genocide in Rwanda, the genocide in Bosnia, what was happening in Afghanistan, endless, endless, endless. And at the center of that, of those genocides, was this horrible rapes, the mass rapes of women to change ethnicity. Okay? It was huge. And oh, it was a killing of, of, of people from, from the other side. I won't have to go through that, but just to give you one idea. In Bo and I'm not talking about Rwanda now, I'm just talking about Bosnia, which is in the center of Europe, right? During that time, the high estimate of the women who were raped was 50,000. Okay? So you can imagine right? and, and what all that meant. Right? I'm just saying that. So my thing was to get that into the Security Council agenda. And for those of you who know the United Nations, you will know that the Security Council is like the peak. Most of the resolutions in the General Assembly is volunteer. You can volunteer to implement, you can uh, use peer pressure to implement and hold yourself accountable. But when it comes to Security Council, it's law. So I put the issue of rape in situation of conflict and made it into a war crime. And that could be taken up by the military and it can be taken up by governments and you wouldn't believe what happened that the first, the first conviction of rape as a war crime came after this resolution for the Rwanda genocide. And then, and then and, but, that, but that was not all. It was not just to see women as victims, it was also very much to see them as central to the peacemaking process and the reconstruction of the type of society that they want. And I have to tell you that the amount of work that went into that, today, again, just think of the difference. At that time, everyone felt so devastated, but today, Rwanda has the highest level of women in parliament and in political office in the world, even beyond the Scandinavian countries. And they are one of the best performing countries in Africa. So I'm just uh, saying again, even in the worst of devastation, if you know how to work and you know what to do and you have a sense of purpose, you can actually make things happen. But this was a time when everyone said, the governments would feel so insulted if you actually uh, raise the issue of ending violence, of violence against women because you're embarrassing all the governments. So uh, you shouldn't be raising it, you know, raise it quietly with them behind closed doors and all that. We put it right up at the General Assembly and we actually got all the top people to come in. And in fact, Nelson Mandela even gave me uh, a message. And the president of the World Bank was also very supportive. So I got the topmost leaders of the world to basically show uh, that, that uh, these issues were not to be hidden under the table. Hmm? And that everybody can actually do something about it. Then, okay, this is, again, I can't tell you the story very much, but, but really it is one of the most touching stories of really working with the orphans, but also with the, with the people in Rwanda who were infected with HIV AIDS, okay, and really bringing hope to them. And, and actually, at this time, I managed to um, uh, mobilize uh, some of the main private sector companies in the US to open up their markets for the products of some of these women, of some of the, of the, of, of the, the, the uh, widows. And I also, this was the, the peace basket uh, story, but uh, you can ask me later on. But, but, but the person whom I also asked to actually help me promote that was Nicole Kidman, which she actually did. So, okay, so this one um, was one of the things that I, I did with the refugees and the people who were affected by the Afghan violence, especially after the um, 1325 uh, agenda on women, peace and security was put in place. And here it was really making sure that in the reconstruction at that time, because of the fall of the Taliban, what happened to women at that time would not repeat itself. And because women were not seen as full citizens, so there was a constitutional change. And one of the things we did was I to actually mobilize the, the society uh, in such a way that women were recognized as equal citizens in their constitution, which is what happened. 
But again, having um, uh, recognition in constitution is one thing. Having it implemented is something else, right? Okay, so, so that, that was my story uh, for, for uh, the work on ending uh, violence against women and so on at the time of the um, change uh, at, at that pivotal moment uh, when the Berlin Wall fell and there was all the UN conferences. So it's really rewriting the global ground rules on behalf of women. Then just when I thought my work was over and I could take some rest, um, uh, I was asked to come back to Asia, because at that time I was working out of my New York office for 13 over years, almost 14 years. Then I was asked to come back to Asia to take over the largest regional commission uh, of the UN um, in Asia because of the global financial crisis. So another pivotal moment. So, okay, fine, go, go to Asia and try and see what, what you can do there. So anyway, so uh, I, of course, having born here and also know uh, Asia very well, I also know that we actually had uh, an Asian miracle where we act, uh, in, did invest, and Singapore is one of them, invested in productive work, getting people employment, getting, uh, developing a middle class, investing in education, investing in healthcare, in our infrastructure, in homes, and so on and so forth, right? But it's an unfinished journey, because even with the Asian miracle, Asia has the largest number or the, the, the largest number or the bulk of the world's most desperate people. In terms of poverty, in terms of hunger, in terms of underweight children, in terms of lack of access to sanitation, to clean water, I can go on and on and, and on, okay? So, so, so there is an unfinished development oh, shush, uh, journey. Uh, and, but, but with the financial crisis is how can we actually sustain the, the kind of dynamism of Asia when it's faced with so many crises. Because there was also the changing landscape before the, uh, on top of the, of the financial crisis. And this is what I, I mentioned uh, earlier with the climate change, the, the type of in, uh, inequalities, the eroded trust, the weakening of uh, trust among some of our neighbors and so on, and also because of technological disruption. So with all that, it was an opportunity. So if you notice what uh, I think what I stand for is I always turn crisis into opportunities. So when you have a crisis of this nature, you need to actually think big and really, really go on how do you, not one thing at a time, but something that actually is a type that lifts all ships, you all, all boats, not one boat at a time, right? So, so it's basically, uh, so for me, it was about rethinking and creating a new development paradigm, which was already being discussed in the United Nations. And this was how do you build sustainability because we cannot grow first and clean up later. We cannot grow first and then can distribute later. We cannot, uh, you know, basically um, think of just uh, high growth without thinking of people's um, um, social well-being as well as our environmental well-being. So it's really the shift from the quantity of growth paradigm uh, uh, to the quality of life paradigm. Okay? So this was what I was actually interested in. And it was about building. I'm, as you know, I, as was mentioned by, by Mayor, I am a social scientist, so I actually believe, and maybe I should stand here this time, because I think, uh, just to give you a little change of scene. <laughs> So uh, I actually believe in building social sustainability and inclusive societies. Okay, here, all right? And, and, and what does this mean? Because, you know, we hear this all the time. It is about closing development gaps, right? It is about increasing social mobility. Because as you have to give people hope. People have to feel that if they put in their effort, they can improve their lives. It's about reducing the type of inequalities in such a way that uh, there are new opportunities. It is about building people's capacities, not destroying them, uh, improving 
uh, human health, uh, social security, and well-being. So it's really, at the end of the day, building the foundations of social sustainability and security in our region. And I say this because you wouldn't believe this again. In Asia, whilst we are so rich, 60% of our population in Asia do not have access to social protection. Okay? So you can imagine what that means when people are growing old and growing sick. Yeah? Then, so I developed, what, or my team and I, uh, whenever I say I, it means my team, uh, I wasn't alone, it was, there was a whole team of people helping me. Uh, we developed what was called the four pillar approach to regional leadership and cooperation. And this meant really uh, how do we sustain the kind of dynamism of our region, but at the same time, pick up the whole need to uh, build social, the kind of social foundation of uh, human security. And so, so we said if we cannot, because at that time of the financial crisis, unlike the 1997 financial crisis, in 1997, we were able to get out of the financial crisis because we were able to trade ourselves out of the crisis. In 2007, 2008, there was a collapse of the G3 markets because of high household debts in the developed countries. So we couldn't actually trade ourselves out of the crisis because we didn't have a global market. Right? And, and now you are talking about the trade wars, right? So, so, so all that comes from there, actually. Right? So, 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 and the fear of losing jobs, basically. So what we had to do then was to try to create a regional market uh, and a seamless market. So we talked about um, uh, the ASEAN economic community, and now we're talking about the RCEP. The idea of RCEP also came into being at that time, and this is the regional cooperation uh, development framework and so on, right? Uh, um, uh, but, but we talked about building not nation-by-nation nation prosperity and dynamism, but building on corridors of prosperity. And in order to create this... Uh, regional market and so on. We had to talk about connectivity in transport because our region of all things was not so well connected huh, at, uh, at that time. And even now, the amount of, of work that has to be done to connect ourselves regionally. Uh, so the building of, of con uh, transport connectivity and of ICT and some of the regional arrangements that was uh, we negotiated in terms of intermodal transport systems and uh, the kind of logistics as well as the type of sustainable urbanization we, we, uh, we were interested in. Uh, today, uh, at the last um, ASEAN meeting, which I noticed, uh, uh, which Singapore uh, chaired, the, the whole emphasis was to bring all the cities together under the smart city framework. Right. So, so I'm just uh, stressing that this is an ongoing conversation. But at that time, uh, uh, as we were developing all this, the the issue was where do we get the money to to build all this. And luckily at that time, Asia was actually rather rich. We had a reserve of four trillion US dollars and it was all caught up in all the, the US bonds and so on. So we actually started the conversation and this with China uh, included uh, uh, kind of at that time of how to develop a regional financial architecture. And today I think one of the things that came out of that was the, th this new bank, it was the, the BRICS bank and the uh, uh, AIDB Bank and so on. So besides the Asian Development Bank. And then finally, and this is something that was, okay, uh, let me just tell you one story just to break the, the seriousness of this. Uh, when I was asked to go to, to Asia, to go back to Asia, my Secretary General said to me, you know, I, I know that you've been working in all these hot spot countries of conflicts and so on. Time to go back to the land of the smiles. Right, I was to go back to Asia and you know, and so on. So I was very pleased. I thought, okay, great, time to relax a little bit, no? uh, and, and then take advantage of you know, going around a bit and all that. Then, to my horror, within like the month that I arrived, there was Cyclonagus, there was the worst floods after that in Thailand, and, and there was the Worst, one of the worst earthquakes in China. There was a Pakistan flood. There was a typhoon in the Philippines. I go on and on and on. So I thought, oh my God. And then on top of that, I was the person in charge of security of staff and their families. Huh? Huh? 
uh, in the midst of all this. And I, I won't tell you, uh, and it was also the worst political conflict in Thailand that in Pattaya actually led to the heads of states being evacuated from the rooftop because they, there was a, a riot I mean, for some of you who, who, who know that. So it was not an easy time. And in fact, I had asked my secretary general to come to the meeting at that time and we had to evacuate him as well. So it was like, you know, great, huh? It was a real test of, of, of leadership, if I can say that. So the whole thing was, how then, so besides the financial crisis, is how do you coordinate a regional response to shared risks and vulnerabilities and is to national but also to man-made disasters and to all, all the discrimination that goes along with that? So, <laughs> I was asked, this was just after that Pattaya uh, horrible incident uh, in, uh, in, in Thailand when they were the chair of ASEAN. Uh, they wanted to keep the, the chair and to hold a meeting in Hua Hin. Uh, which was the, the, the royal town and nobody would be protesting and they held their, their, their meeting there and then, and, but they asked me to actually help with the reconceptualization of the work on connectivity. Right? So together with the president of the Asian Development Bank, President Kuroda, who is now the governor of the Bank of Japan. So together we addressed all the heads of states for the East Asian Summit. So all this was a huge uh, discussion of the future of, of that region. And I think I was the first UN official to be asked to actually address the summit at this level and to make it happen. So this was uh, something that uh, uh, I was very pleased with. And this is because all this was able to happen because of this wonderful man, her dear friend, uh, who was the former Secretary General of ASEAN, uh, who have passed away, Dr. Sorin Pisuan. And this was a foreign minister of Thailand who also was very instrumental, and this of course was a prime minister. So they were, we, we actually, so if you notice what I do, I work from the bottom, I move from the margin to the center, but I work with the most powerful people I can find to make things happen, okay? Soon after the, the earthquake, uh, I went to the epicenter, and I must say that if we're talking about resilience, that's where I learned resilience. I saw resilience in each and Every child whom I met, they all wanted to get back to school. I had never seen the type of devastation. I mean, I couldn't even describe it. Whole towns literally collapsed, right? And things just disappeared. It was like the earth just literally came up and ate up the whole town. And yet these were the children who decided to discontinue going on. Then this was after Cyclone Nagus, the same thing. It was just, just after the, this horrible cyclone, and it was the worst cyclone in the whole history of the, our region. And these are the children with the smiling faces. And, and of course, this was a time when ASEAN and the UN came together, and again, my dearest friend. You know, we worked so well together, and this, I think, is the thing about partnership and relationship. I, don't th I think that at the core of all this are the human connections. Right? It's the fact that it's not just about leadership, it's the way you connect based on shared values and the way you can actually uh, turn sorrow into smiles, turn anger into something that is more positive, uh, turn fear into something that is uh, not so destructive. So, um, I, we are now again, uh, this is almost at the end, uh, we are now at the, basically at another pivotal point. Okay? And the pivotal point is that in 2015, the UN was able to mobilize 196 member states to agree on the sustainable development agenda of transforming our world. And this, uh, people say, oh, there are 17 sustainable development goals. It is so difficult to remember. Uh, uh, so what, what is it? So I'm giving you everyone uh, a, a shortcut to understanding the goal. Just focus on the five Ps. It is really about people. How do you take care of people? How do we become stewardships of, uh, 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 become stewards of our planet? How do we generate prosperity that is shared? How do we develop partnership for the implementation? And how do we actually sustain the peace that, that we have? So that's a very shortcut way, right? So, so this whole um, 
uh, point is really to show you uh, how, how is it we can actually build social sustainability, planet sustainability, because everyone talks about environmental sustainability, which is true, but we also have to invest in social sustainability and also building up resilience uh, in human well our well-being, and I have to tell you, it is not easy. We were just discussing about even about the aging population, the issue of not just physical health, but it's about emotional and mental health. Huh? I think it, the fact that that sometimes the stress is so much, and we don't have enough community, and so on, that uh, that uh, we develop all kinds of uh, mental stress and 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 emotional stress, and destroy ourselves in the process. So, and then, and of course, the whole thing about. Um, uh, the uh, the fact that we have to deal with the data revolution, the big data, and also with the technological kind of transformation, and but I honestly feel that uh, that if we really want to shift from the quantity of growth to the quality of life, we actually have to talk about the public private sector governance and weak institutions, and 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 really also about the age of social media and how do we actually function in that uh, age. Huh? And what is, uh, I, I can go more into that, but I wouldn't uh, do it now, because this is a whole issue of collaboration and partnership. But what is also important is to have a bold, accountable leadership for a changing world. And this basically means helping to rebuild trust and solidarity. You know, really rethinking some of the ways we implement our development, and also taking greater ownership of global and regional commons. It's not just about our national commons. We cannot, we, uh, uh, one very good example is clean air, okay? clean air or polluted air. Huh? Uh, we all know that we will all suffer if our air is not clean. But is air something we can control nationally? Or is it a moving global regional good? Right? So, so this is something, or water for that matter. So, so, so really um, uh, making sure that we think of global and regional commons and also bringing, bringing clarity to public discussions and conversation. I say this because in the age of social media, it's so easy to communicate with disrespect and to generate hate speech and to, to demonize the other and so on and so forth. And this is not at all helpful. All right, then let me now uh, move on to uh, say uh, just a reflection of leadership in the multilateral uh, setting, which is what I, I uh, spend most of my life on. And this is how do you manage one of the challenges is of course uh, the, complexity, uh, the complexity challenge, is how do you navigate across culture, religion, language, geography, uh, geopolitical conditions, geopolitics, uh, legal and governance system, right? Uh, I gave one example, but I, I wouldn't go there now. I, we don't have time. And then also the multiplicity of partners. You have very different interest groups and power groups. So basically, it is um, how do we uh, interact with our stakeholders to build common ground and consensus because it's not easy. And I often say that it is not to negotiate for the low ground, but to negotiate for the high ground. And then finally, being very clear of how to shape the content and direction of leadership and how do we manage our institutions and systems of accountability to deliver for people. And so finally, this is the last thing. Uh, why do I do the work I do? As I mentioned earlier, is because I really deeply try to lift the values of the UN system. I believe that we can all be co-creators of the type of future that we want and that we can indeed imagine a secure world of peace and prosperity for all so that our people don't have to be sadder, they don't have to be angrier, and they don't have to be so fearful. And, then, and, and the only way to get out of that is a power of empathy as well as optimism and the power of, of community and alliance and making sure partnerships work. And then many people ask me, how on earth do I survive for so long in the worst or the largest bureaucracy and the most complicated political environment? And I said that one of the things that helped me to succeed is to know your world and what needs to change and also to have substantive leadership. I work very hard on substance, but also to strategic leadership, political leadership, knowing what to transform, which battles to fight and how 
to turn resistance around. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to end by saying we're never alone, we're one of many, and therefore we need to actually use some smart power and not think that everybody, that we are the ones that are responsible for everything, uh, to make sure that everybody comes together and we just use our little power and that, but then uh, in our little spaces and wherever we occupy, build trust, be a beacon of hope, uh, be a kind of a center of gravity and a driver of change that you all want to see. So thank you very much. Uh, that's.